So, hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. And today, we, uh, our, well, our presentation is entitled The Oil Canary, or Is the Oil Canary Dead in the Cage? And we're going to be doing a, a deep dive into all things oil today, really looking forward to it. Uh, it is quite a chart heavy uh, presentation as well, I might add. So, uh, if you are listening in on the podcast, please head over to the show notes and I'll be putting a link in there for a PDF of all the, uh, all the slides in today's presentation. I'm joined today by our Chief Strategist. Uh, David Llewellyn Smith. G'day, David. G'day, Tim. And by uh, Nicholas Wells and MB Funds Head of Investments, Damien Klassen. Hi, Tim. Fantastic. We'll roll into the agenda for today. Uh, so we're going to start off by looking at some of the long-term economics of oil, uh, commodity versus technology curves, uh, a little bit of an insight into some pricing, so looking at um, batteries or other alternatives to oil and the, and the pricing premiums. Uh, we'll then uh, jump into midterm demand and supply, and then as always, uh, cover off and finish off with uh, how these implicate our, uh, our portfolios every day at Nucleus Wealth and the MB Fund. So with no further ado, let's jump into it, and I'll hand over to Damien for, to kick us off, sorry, for the, uh, for the commodity curves, long term. Hi Tim. Yeah, so just wanted to take a, a, big, a bit of a step back on the oil price first, because there's, there's two big um, effects that are, one one's a long term sort of cap on the oil price, and the other one's sort of a, the other one's a mid term cap on the oil price. And I just wanted to talk through the 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 logic and the the thoughts behind that, and so you can sort of see where it, where it sits. Uh, the first, I just wanted to, to highlight. I've got a, a chart up there for anyone just listening in, um, just showing uh, strip ratios of Queensland coal and how they've sort of gone up from they've basically doubled over the last uh, 30 or 40 odd years, um, and. This is pretty similar across most of the, uh, whether you're talking oil or, or commodity, whatever commodity you are, we're generally having to dig deeper um, and, and move more things to find it, and, and it's, it's more expensive. So um, flicking on to the next one, though, shows us that uh, on, a sh- on a shorter term basis, we've got the, uh, uh, sorry, on a, s- a similar longer term basis, we can see where solar sits as a uh, on, on its cost curve. So it's sort of come from, from right off the off the chart and it's sort of now come down to the level where it's actually uh, playing a part in terms of determining the cost of cost of electricity. And then you flick on to the, uh, the next one where I'm just sort of zooming into the last few years to sort of show where these things cap out. So basically solar is now cheaper than uh, most forms of uh, energy, depending upon where you are and, and how good the solar resources are and, and things like that. But the um, solar on its own is, is generally cheaper and... Uh, because it's on this technology curve, every year there's something uh, you know, new technology, um, producing more, seeing different ways to uh, different ways to to um, produce the same energy for for lower costs. Um, and so, oil itself is just uh, you know another form of energy. And so, uh, the the benefit from oil though is it's uh, had this portability premium because oil is really handy. Um, you know, it's very hard to, to stick anything else in your car. You don't want to put coal in your car. Um, it's uh, it's a very dense form of energy. Um, and, you know, batteries are, are a longer term competitor to it. Mm. So so basically electricity plus batteries um, is a longer term. Um, but the issue is that uh, we're not there at the moment. And oil has got, in this portability premium, oil's, oil's got this, this benefit over coal where but for the same unit of energy, um, oil is much more expensive and same mm. with gas for the same unit of energy oil is much more expensive and because it is so convenient to stick oil in in your car okay yeah and sure. so and that's um, what you mean by the portability premium portability yeah yeah so i've been trading off that for for years in oil but um so it's, it's facing this it's facing two competitors one is that the cost is coming down for solar and mm-hmm. so now solar is cheaper than coal and all these and a number of other uh, factors is is that starting to weigh now on the on the cost of electricity? So that means that while there's a portability premium, um, if if your your competitive your cost of uh, electricity is falling, and, mm-hmm. and I guess um, with a, with a note to most Australian listeners, that hasn't been happening in Australia, but that's <laughs> been a that's a, a function of the market uh, we're facing as opposed to to what's happening globally. Mm-hmm. Uh, globally, we're we're seeing um, you know we are seeing these effects come through. Uh, and so, so the next slide then I've, I've got is is basically showing where they meet. So, so at the moment, um, so just looking at this portability premium and, and comparing, saying, well, if if I've it, 
the main competitor for a car driving around with a petrol engine is saying, well, what's what's going to cost for a, a battery plus an electric car? Mm-hmm. And you go back 10 years and you're probably talking five times the price. I guess I was, I was sort of thinking, um, you know, around about 50 cents uh, per um, per kilometer. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas, um, oh, sorry, 50 cents. Sorry, I've got this on the... I've, Got the wrong scales there on the on the, on the chart, but the uh, this is a cost per yeah per fifteen thousand kilometres per year. Okay, and what it's showing is that the petrol cost has basically been um, uh, your gap between your your driving your petrol car and driving a um, uh, driving electric car has yep. been has been reducing. It's still there's still a decent gap. It's probably still about uh, three times the cost. Okay. Um, having said that, that's if you're that's for a typical person driving fifteen thousand kilometres a year. Mm. If you go to somebody in a taxi, um, sort of driving hundred thousand um, kilometres a year, or, or maybe you know an Uber driver, mm-hmm. um, it's actually pretty much break even at the moment. Wow. Yeah. So you know the, the broad steps. So you, you're looking at um, actually I've got some broader numbers sort of going forward, and and so we've got. The technology coming, we've got the cost of uh, the electricity coming down. We've also got the cost of batteries coming down. And the next slide's just sort of going into uh, how we've seen pretty much 20% per annum growth for the last 10, 20% per annum declines Decline, in, yep. in, okay. in prices in batteries over the last uh, 10 years. And so, and that's uh, a product of more manufacturers, better technology um yeah, innovation, I guess, in the in the field, yeah. or is it? Uh, it's a mix. Yeah, to mix. Um, a, a lot of it is actually just producing more. Okay. So, and that's that, that's been solar as well. Is there's this? There's basically a, you know, if you have to produce a thousand widgets, mm-hmm. uh, it costs you whatever. If you have to produce produce a hundred thousand, mm-hmm. your your cost per widget comes down dramatically. Yep. And okay. so, a lot of it's just the as people produce more and more, uh, the cost comes down. But there is a, a fair whack of um, technology sort of hidden into that as well and yep. you know any, i guess anyone who follows any of the sort of technology um magazines or anything in terms of this area every second day there's a new study and somebody's done broken some record somewhere and stored more or, or yep. got it out cheaper or, or done whatever and so there's a, there's a, a range of new technologies you know the next sort of 10 15 years you can easily see where the, the technology is going to keep um keep improving okay sure and so what that gives us roughly is this what i call a levelized cost and um, so just ballpark, you know, a battery is going to cost you about $10,000 extra if you're buying a car, mm-hmm. if you want to get about a four, 500 kilometer range mm. uh, in, terms of your, in terms of your battery. Uh, that's uh, for every 10,000 kilometers, it's going to save you about somewhere between $150 and $350. Mm. So depending upon which country you're in and, and um, you know, how, and, and things like that. So, uh, and a lot of it's taxes and, and all price up and down. Yep. But, you know, if you, if you called it to $250 uh, a year in savings uh, and you've got to spend 10000 it obviously doesn't, you know, the, the numbers don't, don't really add up for the, the consumer. Yep. But as that keeps coming down uh, and we start seeing that, um, you know, we can see taxis are, are probably saving more like $3,000 a year. Mm-hmm. So if you're outlaying 10000 saving 3000 okay, well, in the four years, I'm, I'm the front. Yep, sure. Um, and in, in some markets with, with higher... Uh, with higher taxes, you, you couldn't be getting over five thousand dollars back. So, sort of, you got a two-year payback. And so, with, with with these figures that you've put up here, um, is this sort of just raw, um, I guess, raw inputs and raw costs? So, this is not. Um, no, no, this not, is on, on the this is on the road. Yeah, no, sorry. What, yeah. what I mean by that though is because um, the next stage from here would be then say some form of government inter- intervention where they turn around and say, well, you know, uh, we'll halve your registration if it's an electric vehicle or an electric taxi, for example, in a busy yep. city. Yep. Um, so your payback period might be 12 months rather than three years or four yeah. years. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no subsidies in this. And, and a lot of countries have subsidies. Yeah, so, sure. Um, yeah, plenty of ones. And, and uh, a lot of them have quotas, quotas as well. So, um, yeah, there's a certain number of licenses will, will be given out in, I think Shanghai's got a limit on how many petrol licenses and then the, the electric licenses is just uncapped you know, <laughs> go for it yeah, yeah. okay and it'll so, well all, almost certainly be last yeah to, to roll those out in yeah. australia yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah given the uh, political push to protect coal etc mm. yeah but but you know i guess in the end um australia's the demand from Australia is not going to make a difference. So, like, it's, it's, this is a global thing. We're talking. We're a country you know, town in China. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and the question, if you flick to the the next slide, I've got a few talking government intervention. Here's a there's a number of countries that have come out 
who have actually said that they're looking at banning petrol cars from, from ranging from sort of 2025 to, to 2035 or, or, or even longer for some of them. But, you know, so you're looking at California, Germany, uh, China, you know, those those three uh, between them is, you know, a, a pretty decent chunk of, of world the world economy. Um, and, and that's your, you know, that's your sort of, at a certain stage, once you hit these break-evens, uh, the question is, do you then have governments to say, well, okay, we'll just ban it. That will, you know, once, yep. once, it, once people shouldn't care whether they're buying petrol or, or electric and people have taken up electric in, in a certain state, in, in enough uh, frame, then, yep. you know, do you, do you just get banned? Get like through? critical mass and then you just find all the things that are wrong with the incumbent and <laughs> get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Interesting just to quickly note as well that to compare Norway with Australia, just, mm. just to put a bit of a boot into the local political economy yeah no Dave never when, when you, you know you've got Norway that's built this enormous sovereign wealth fund based on oil yeah mm. and yet here they are leading the way in in uh, removing it locally remo- removing it locally <laughs> and, and setting new kind of normatives to to expand that globally as well whereas in Australia of course we took all of our ill-gotten commodity gains and spent them on expensive housing what have you and and tax cuts ha- ha- tax cuts <laughs> and and minimum savings and therefore are forced to protect the the rentiers that are still producing the the carbon mm. output commodities mm. okay so, yeah, yeah. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> luckily we don't get much in the way of royalties from from being the world's largest gas exporter yeah, that's so, right. yeah there you go <laughs> you can't cook our own book there <laughs> it's up there <laughs> yes uh okay so transport in the end, for, for oil, look, there are other uses. You do have industry uses. You do have um, you know, some non-energy uses, and some of it's for heating and things like that. Most of the heating is pretty much gone now. Um, oh, sorry. Not, not, most of the demand in heating has, has fallen dramatically from where it was years ago and, and less and less because it, it used to be that you could run diesel generators as being a convenient way of, you know, I could ship the oil in and, and mm-hmm. run them in remote locations or... or or run heating oil and and um, and use other products in uh, for heating. And now with such low gas in the U.S. and the the, the relative price of oil to to other forms and and, and batteries storage, mm. um, you know that that demand's come down a lot there. But in the end, the, the whole game of this is is transport uh, and and particularly passenger vehicles. Could could you see a scenario where um, the primary use of oil? Um, for safer transport is not necessarily pouring it into the car, but pouring it into a generator off-site somewhere and using that electricity to, to fuel the car. Is that sort at, of like a secondary at, option at the right price? Absolutely. Yeah. Like I think, and, and I think where 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 we're taking this is that uh, as batteries come down in price, you won't care. You know, and you, you sort of don't really care as much whether the where the electricity sources come from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, obviously some people will care, but yep. um, the it'll be the lowest cost. Whoever can produce this at the lowest cost will. Will be where you you'll um, you produce from, but but as a as a good you know as a as a sign of that, um, uh, a lot of the Middle East countries uh, have done are doing a lot in solar power. Mm. So they used to burn a lot of their own oil for for because it's so cheap. Yep. For for electricity, but now they're sort of going well. Let's use solar power and okay. Let's let's sell the oil at a premium if we can. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so what that says to me is that there's a. Um, Actually, I might just skip forward one one more slide. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've just got some adoption uh, charts up, and so what I'm just looking at here is just a, the adoption of different technologies over time, uh, and it's a it's a pretty compl- it's a pretty uh, convoluted graph. But but the key part of what it's showing is that when the sort of telephone and TV and 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 other sort of technologies picked up in the sort of early 1900s, they took quite a long time to get. Uh, adoption rates up to sort of the 60 plus 60 plus percent Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of them sort of would take 20 30 40 years Uh, in recent times the adoption rates have just um, you know we're on on a straight line upwards it's sort of smartphones you know a few few years around few years you know one or two people had them next thing everyone's got one Mm. Um, you know digital cameras uh, tablets uh, social media you know there's all these sort of there's all these examples of, of new technologies that's, that just go from being nowhere to to within five years um, ubiquitous yep and so the question for me is um, when this when this period happens and we don't know when it is you know it could be 2050 it could be 2025 it's somewhere somewhere in that range mm-hmm. um, I'm expecting quite a sharp um, yep. change at that point 
where you will either get government bans or you'll just get people just naturally picking it up and saying, well, yes, I'll take this because it's it's now more convenient and cheaper and... and, uh, yep. you know, and, and Demonstrated benefit and they just go, okay, well, at the same price. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take, exactly. I'll take the new one. So flipping back to that last one then, is then I'm just showing the what's expected from all the major agencies at the moment in terms of uh, oil demand growth. And so they've basically got all got oil growing, oil demand growing, uh, except for the IEA sustainable development, which is which is not the actual IEA's current policy uh, graph, but they've all got it growing to 2040 uh, and, and further out for, for some of them. So I guess what I'm positing is that uh, the longer term demand, uh, I believe, is going to go through a step change. Uh, so, but but we're, we're we're facing over the longer term, we're facing this this technology curve that's that's basically sitting above uh, the, the price of oil and saying, well. The oil price isn't going to two hundred dollars because mm. at two hundred dollars, uh, electric cars are all of a sudden. That's it. They're a bit, better than. Yeah, they'll be in next week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We'll all be driving Teslas. <laughs> yep. And so, um, and so that you've got this cap on your on your oil, your longer term cap on the oil price, and that sort of leads us in now to the the mid term where there's a there's another cap on the on the oil price which is sort of in the, in the mid term which is the uh, the shale oil. Uh, so. Um, just, just before we jump into that, with a couple of questions we might just work through as well from our live audience. Um, just one on uh, the range available. So the range available for hydroelectric vehicles compared to full uh, EVs, electric vehicles, is significant. Uh, given the vast distance of, uh, of Australia, uh, would it be better place to invest in hydroelectric innovation as opposed to pure EVs? Have you got anything to say about that one? Uh, absolutely. I've got lots to say on, on investing yeah. technology. It's always really, really hard to pick a winner. Yeah. Uh, I find it much easier to pick a loser, and that's what a lot of this is about saying, I know who's going to lose out of this. Oil's going to be the loser. Yep. Whether uh, hydrogen comes up with the right... Um, you know the right mix that appeals to consumers and, and range and, and things and other and other factors, mm -hmm. or whether it's uh, electric, or whether it's some combination, perhaps something we've never even heard of. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, but I'm um, I'm pretty sure oil's going to be the loser out of that out, mm -hmm. out of it. Uh, I always yeah, my, I keep harking, harking back whenever I talk technology to the the uh, in my early days as a, as an internet analyst, and you know everyone knew about the the new search was fantastic and knew it was going to be the biggest and greatest thing, and so everyone was buying. Uh, Lycos and Excite and Yahoo and Alta Vista and all these companies that are no longer around mm. uh, and um, the real winner was Google which wasn't even listed wasn't even listed so right. you know, everyone's, everyone's fighting over you know yeah last place essentially exactly <laughs> yeah. and so and, and so uh, yeah trying to pick exactly the technology that's going to solve that's going to be the, the winner is, is very difficult Okay, no worries. Thanks for that, Damien. Um, the other one here, I might, I might just put it as a point rather than a question. What is the oh no, what, what is the economic implication of a flattening price of oil in direct correlation to the future reduction in the production of oil due to other sources of energy? I feel that kind of encapsulates Absolutely. the entire subject of this webinar, but anyway. A, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's... that's Actually, that's, we might go on because I think we're answering that in the in this next sort of midterm part. And okay. because it's, it'll actually lead us into that. So, if we flick to the... The next one is just sort of showing as as a uh, where what's happened to U.S. production, uh, and you can see U.S. production has just got a rocket under it for the last ten years, nine nine years even. Uh, and this is the this is all the shale oil boom. So basically, the uh, U.S. grew from uh, you know, the early 1900s at sort of a million barrels a day up to 10 million barrels a day in uh, the heyday of uh, the the late 1970s. Uh, it fell back down, basically halved almost in, in production uh, and before taking off and now it's at record highs. Uh, if you had 12 million barrels a day, uh, turned into a net exporter, you know, the, the whole key has been this shale oil. And shale oil has got some really different um, characteristics. Mm, okay. So ordinarily the, oil, the whole oil market was driven by this, this um, factor that it took 30, 40 years to develop these, these fields. So if you needed more demand... Uh, and if the oil price spikes and you need more demand and everyone rushes out and starts exploring, it's like, yeah, well, great, I'll see you in 20, 30 years once, once you've developed it. Mm. Uh, so it, it really was this long-term long play and uh, it meant that the, uh, the elasticity of, of supply was, wasn't, very, wasn't very great at all in sure. terms of responses. Now we have uh, shale oil, which basically you can produce, um, which has this, this factor of, 
which initially sounds like a negative one, it, it produces about 80% of the oil in the first two, two or three years. Mm-hmm. So it flows really quickly and then slows right off and takes a long time to get, you know, probably runs for another 10 years-ish. Um, and you, you're hard to get any. And so at first bite, you're like, oh, that sounds terrible. You know, all this big flow and then the flow dra- drops, drops off dramatically. Mm. But from a financing perspective, this is exactly what you want. I want to, because I'm going to spend a lot of money up front. Mm. I can get that Most money back, back straight yeah. away. And then the, the profit all comes over the, the, you know, over the next 10 years. And it especially means for debt financing, like if you, if you want to debt finance a traditional oil well, it's very difficult. You need a huge balance sheet and you need to be able to say, well, yes, I'm, I'm buying now and I'm running the risk that in 10 years time or 15 years time by the time my oil well is actually up and running yep um the oil price will still be where it is and it'll justify the debt whereas on a two-year time frame you're um you can basically lock in you can t- get the debt you yep. can uh forward you know, uh you can swap your, your oil price and, and lock in your price yep to, to have be enough to pay the debt and then and then you're off and running mm-hmm. and so what that meant is this the boom we've seen in oil is is been as much of wall street story as it has a a, an actual oil story because not only um is that a good thing from well well, not only is a good thing from a financing perspective but uh because so much of this is wanted and needed and this is new technology um it's a great story for for wall street um investment banks because they make their money from from doing listings yep. and and finding investors and, and deals and short deals <laughs> yeah so you basically and raising um, the debt yeah yep. exactly so you're basically saying look you need 50 million dollars to to drill a few wells and and hook up to a few oil lines fantastic you know let me let me take my slice we'll raise 60 you yep. know i'll take a slice here and a slice there and we pay some interest and off you go mm. uh and so they the, the whole um they're they're not particularly interested in making a profit, I guess. In, in the end, they don't care. They just want they just want the capital raising to keep coming. Yep. So you know, there's a lot of complaints now about you know a lot of these a lot of these oil wells. They're basically just whatever money they're getting, they're just turning back around and dumping straight into back into the um, into the next one into the next one. Yeah. And so the actual cash profile of a lot of these uh, shale producers isn't particularly good, but uh, that's partly driven by the whole Wall Street. You know, we just want to raise more capital and. If you if you have a successful project and pay out your pay out your investors their profits, mm. we now want to go and raise the money back. We'd like that to happen, and then we'll go raise the money back from, from the same people to, to to invest in the new one and, and take our slice. And so so just looking at that chart there, um, you know, that's a boom. Obviously, that's that's got to be you know indi- indicative of problems ahead. Mm. Would you would you agree, or is this something that you think is sustainable? Is this going to continue to the moon because Wall Street's flush with cash oh, and they're just I happy to, to keep churning and burning and until we run out, you know, until shale's gone? Yeah. Look, the, well, the the key in this is is that it's become the swing producer mm. globally. Mm. Like whenever, as Damo said, you know, the former supply elasticity has been resolved by shale. Mm. And so as Damo's curves come down and cap the oil price, in a normal situation, you might think that actually could be a bullish story for the oil price. Mm. Uh, but because nobody invests. Yeah, yeah, yeah nobody stop. invests and yeah. demand is, isn't falling yeah. that fast. Sure. But because shale has come in with this kind of quick-fired solution uh, where it can turn on and off really you know, swiftly, um, it's become you know, this other supply curve sitting on the price mm. Uh, and so it's become an invaluable way for the oil market to correct. Yeah, sure. Yep. Uh, and adjust to all of these different trends and curves and what have you. Yeah. So, and, and the other so thing you've not, seen, it's not really in danger of, of popping, mm. um, except in very short term waves where you have, for instance, right now where we, we get we've got a, an imminent glut. Mm. Uh, but to look at that and think of it as an overall bubble, no. Yeah. Okay. All uh, right. The other thing is. It's uh, that part of that rise has been. There's, there's other countries that are that are that that are tailing off their production as that happens, and OPEC in particular is holding back production, trying to keep the oil price high. Yeah, sure. And so part of that's been, you know, part of the, the rise of the US uh, is it keeps rising, and and so the Saudis and and Russians have been holding back on production. Um, Surely they can't be happy with this scenario, though, can they? Is no, this sort of like so, a bit so of an OPEC versus that. Wall Street sort of. <laughs> yeah, so they've got to work out where the where the right level is. Yeah. At lower levels, when it was going from from five million dollars, five or six million barrels a day of production to to seven or eight, mm. wasn't as much of an issue. Yep. Now that they're you know the biggest producer and they just keep keeps coming and keeps com- keeps coming, uh, you'd, you'd think it'd have to weigh on their minds in mm. terms of um, and and that was initially you know some of the fall from uh, uh, some of the initial falls. 
when the the oil price fell from $100 back to uh, sort of 30 I think it bottomed out, out a few years ago, yeah. 28 um, And that's that dip there in the line, the straight line up mm, in shale production. That was, uh, you know, the, the part of the reason for that was basically uh, let's get rid of all these shale guys because the, the whole part was shale guys were producing $100 of oil. They, mm. Their break-evens were $100. We let's let the oil price fall, smash them, get them out of the market, then we can let the, then we can, you know, the oil price can drift back up again. Yep. But the issue with with break evens, uh, there's a couple of one is there was technolo- technological gains, mm. but also break evens are a little bit confusing in that uh, break evens are affected by the there's a there's a circular relationship. Mm. So if the oil price is hundred dollars, well there's wells that'll come on that, that are profitable at hundred that are they're only just break even at hundred dollars mm. that would have never been put on at fifty dollars. So they're still there yep. at fifty dollars, but they're just not in production. So yeah, okay. You know, it depends on how you want to actually measure those. Uh, the next chart. We've got falls into that where this is one done by the uh, uh, the Dallas Fed, and they they make some estimates of what the break evens are for um, for oil wells, uh, shale oil wells, and they've got the what they call the long dated WTI futures. So you basically go out uh, two or three years and you look at what the price is, and then you get a pretty good match for where the uh, where the break evens are. And that's sort of saying exactly what I was talking about before, whether whether it's explicitly done or, or implicitly done, that whole part about uh, if the if your longer term oil price is um, if you can if you can go in and lock that in three years out, build a raise some money, build a well, yep. then uh, then all of a sudden that's your your factor that's going to keep your keep the lid on these uh, these oil prices. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, so I guess uh, and that's been a lot more stable. In the short term, so we've seen the short term sort of bounce around over the last few years, you know, down to twenty eight dollars and back up, you know, from a hundred dollars down to twenty eight and back up to uh, what did we get, seventy or eighty, and then back down again. So it's it's it really has bounced around a lot. The longer term has pretty much been around that fifty fifty to uh, fifty five dollars and uh, drifting downwards from and drifting things. down, yeah. yeah. And so that's uh, and that's drifting down with production increases. Yep. So you know that's your there your two. Um, the two curves sort of holding things down. Your short-term curve, you've got this. Uh, where can where can the oil oil shale guys produce that? Yep. Hold you in one place, and then uh, but the big one to keep watching is that uh, yeah, batteries plus electric. Uh, when that sort of hits the breakover, uh, the, the the point where it crosses over, that's where um, you know you're it's not going right. higher. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Just one final question before we roll into the. Um the midterm uh, projections um, and reflections. What time frame is predicted before the convergence of new technologies of energy production uh, lead into new, I think it must be mega, mega companies, uh, much the like of current petrol companies such as BP. Although BP for, you know, might be an example of, <laughs> of the former and the latter perhaps, depending on what they want to do. Uh, is there something that you keep on the, on the radar? Is there, is there going to be a... You know, a, a Tesla uh, energy, or is it, you know, is it, is, no, it, is it like that? Is it? More? No, I think it's more. It's more distributed. Yep. Uh, so, so I guess let, let's say let's say solar is your winner, yep. um, and you've got a bunch of people with solar panels sitting out there, feeding it into batteries and storing the energy and yep. feeding it out to cars or, or wherever it is. Uh, that's a pretty much a distributed system. So mm. you might find, um, and, and as well, it's a it's a real race on costs. So yep. maybe maybe somebody will come up with some breakthrough technologies and, and be your, your new BPs where, but, but you know, they'd need a significant drop in, in cost. Mm. And um, it's probably, arguably, it's more likely to happen on the battery side, mm-hmm. I suppose, because the batteries. It's got to the stage where the battery is the bigger cost of the the two, and uh, it's still falling at quite quite high levels. So maybe you see in the batteries, but again, you know, there's so many different competing technologies in both of them. Yep. Um, someone would really need to do a, a step change difference to, to to gain enough dominance to then have enough R and D to to, to, to take, take over the world. <laughs> yeah. But there's certainly a lot of Chinese companies. You know, China made a big push in this um, yeah. ten years ago, and 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 tried to basically. In a way, basically tried to um, get rid of the the competitive by, by pushing prices so far down that uh, competitive solar companies right around the world went bust. Yep. And so yeah, there are um, yeah there are issues with governments and 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 obviously with climate change, you'd you'd expect governments to to want to sort of back 
Yep. Um, these types of projects. But in effect, it's going to be sort of a sum of many parts as opposed to a couple of giant conglomerates that sort of uh, own all the reserves of the world. It's pretty hard to own the, all the reserves of, a, of the sun, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I expect so. Except, except if you've got a huge technological breakthrough. Okay, yeah, sure, mm-hmm. perfect. All right, well, on that note, um, perhaps we'll roll across to uh, the midterm oil glut. Is that, yeah. Dave, take it away. Sure. So, as I mentioned... Uh, we're in the midst of a, um, another, one, another one of our intermittent oil gluts where we go through these, these pulses. Uh, and at the moment, it's been driven by uh, a couple of different factors. On the demand side, you know, the global economy is starting to suffer a fair bit from the trade war. And the uh, EIA recently downgraded uh, demand growth for the, for the world. Uh, And if you just want to quickly pop over to the next chart, we can see this already kind of playing out in US inventories. That that top chart there shows you US oil inventories that have been climbing now pretty steadily for quite a while. And that that line, that blue line is continuing to rise. So if you go back, Tim, uh, excuse me. Um, The US is, because it's the the swing producer and also you know the best kind of most most transparent market is the most useful in measuring mm-hmm. kind of global oil supply yeah sure um so demand's looking a bit shaky and then you know we've got the supply boom coming out of the u.s but there are some some you know headwinds as well venezuela is is grinding lower very consistently and the- having said that though it's sort of getting to the stage now where it's it's not as important like it, it used to be a sort of four million barrel a day producer and it's sort of back down around one now so it's sort of mm. yeah, yeah a lot of the falls behind us yeah um libby has been having quite a few problems uh in the last couple of months um, just political economy problems uh instability and what have you and that's dented their production a little and then of course we've got this ongoing uh you know kind of uh, uh aggression f- from the u.s towards iran uh which you know, has it dented their production, but then there are questions around how China will play into that. Mm. Um, it's almost a bit of a proxy war going on with Iran between the US and China, and China tends to take Iran in oil regardless of what the US says, mm. and especially right now when they're at each other's throats, that may be even more so than usual. Yep. And they usually get a pretty decent discount on, <coughs> on, the, on the market price for doing so. They do. It's not all generosity. Um, so... Uh, you know, at the moment, probably the number one hope for constraining oil supply and starting to, to drop some of these climbing inventories is more OPEC uh, retrenchment. Saudi Arabia has already said it's going to do so. Mm-hmm. That said, a lot of the other OPEC, uh, OPEC Plus, which includes Russia, have not been terribly enthusiastic about counting production again. So, and, and part of that's that, that graph we looked at earlier. You know, it's pretty hard to say, yeah, yeah, let's cut production so that the US shale guys can that's right. we'll, feather their nests. We'll knock out a million dollars a bar- million more barrels a day, and, and then they'll lift a million more barrels a day, and we're back to where we started from. And yep. Yep. yeah, so you know, I mean, this brings you back to the US, uh, and is why we've seen the the oil price falling pretty consistently over the last month, back down to break evens for shale, but it's not really low enough yet to cause a big dent in. Uh, rigs and hence production Mm -hmm. that said rigs have been tailing off so u.s production will begin to fall over the next six months Uh, so if you want to pop forward um you you can see uh basically that the um, pace of um, output growth that's what this new blue chart is um is diminishing Mm. in the u.s and that's going to continue Uh, and that will will help uh you know, rebalance so, the market a little. And just to put that in context, what we're saying here is we're talking about the second derivative here. So it's still yeah. still increasing, but, yeah. but, rate of change. but the rate of yeah, the rate of increase is, is yeah. starting to slow. And okay. we've got a long way to go before it actually starts to fall. So uh, you know, the as if demand growth continues to diminish and you can ask raise a question at this point as the Fed starts to cut and what have you and markets are all kind of, you know, bouncing on new booms and what have you, that, that might bring some relief to demand. But uh, for the time being, it still looks like shale is going to, you know, steadily um, move towards zero growth, yeah. but but not but not not in any kind of crash at this yeah. point. And look, to get it negative last time, as I said, oil price has had to go to thirty odd dollars from pretty much from hundred dollars pretty quickly down to thirty, mm. yeah, uh, which got rid of a lot of production. Uh, I, but in the meantime, the technologies have, have kept on improving; their 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 efficiencies keep on improving. Uh, 
I would say I would think that you'd still need you need to get it definitely under forty dollars mm. to to really if you wanted to to stop yeah. the US the US shale guys definitely under forty dollars and maybe maybe that's not even enough maybe you do need to get back down closer to thirty yeah. again before well it's also that 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 um, medium term futures market that you showed us is yes, that where absolutely. that that number really has to drop so that they can't forward sell their production mm. uh, and that hasn't dropped enough yet either <laughs> yeah. so so if we get swing to the next chart we can see that there there has been impact like the, the u.s rig count has been steadily tailing off but it isn't enough yet to really um, balance the market so uh just keep going there tim um so so we're in a glut in the short term um the longer term obviously you know we think is is very shaky for oil and quite troubled um, so, you know, in terms of kind of investment implications in the immediate term, um, the U.S. economy is kind of uh, flipped on its traditional relationship to the oil price, uh, given it's become, you know, this very large swing producer. Mm. Uh, traditionally, when the oil price fell, you would expect to see consumption rise, you know, people driving more, but just also spending more with all that discretionary cash that they get as, uh, as their gas prices fall. But these days, um, ca- the, the, the shale or capex is large enough for that, the hit that it takes on the production side uh, in the economy and um, just the investment that dries up. Mm-hmm. Um, that balances out to almost net or even negative for the US economy when the oil price falls. So, uh, you know, there's a kind of double impact now in the US. When, when the oil price falls, you'll see inflation come off, which we're already seeing. Mm-hmm takes a while for that to reach kind of core inflation which is what bothers the fed but it does get there in the end mm-hmm. uh, and you actually see diminishing economic activity as well and, and what, what david's saying it <coughs> takes longer to to get to core is because core doesn't include the, the direct effect of energy but yep. it does include the it, well effectively it, it includes the secondary effects so people yep. yeah people start having to uh so oil prices fall and and it takes off some of your cost pressures um and, and so you can see that in, in other sort of So it's sort of gets baked into the secondary um, outcomes. Yeah, whether it's yep. affected by wages or, or um, other transport costs or cost of, yeah. Yep, okay. So, uh, so at this stage, you know, we've got about oh, 25% downside, I think, something like that for energy prices in the US over the next six months, hmm. based on where oil's already fallen, roughly the same for Europe. Uh, so there's a lot of you know, deflationary or disinflationary pulse coming in. Uh, And then that'll be exacerbated too by by what we just talked about with the falling production, etc. So basically this says, you know, there's the Fed, despite a very tight labour market in the US, is going to have scope to cut, Mm. which we saw last night. It was very dovish. uh, And it's really setting up to cut in July and and at least once more this year, if not more. Mm. Uh, And so the the outrageous US bond bull market that's underway, the one that uh, you know was supposed to go completely the other way, according to uh, bond bears and inflationista, uh, is going to keep going. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, then you've got the whole range of effects that come from falling interest rates in the US. You expect to see a weaker US dollar, uh, the, the whole equity risk premium um, in in stocks drives. Uh, um, price earnings ratio is higher, mm-hmm. so you get you know these crazy stock takeoffs, which we're also seeing at the moment. Uh, but at the same time, you know you will see impacts on real activity. So you get this sort of crazy situation where you've got markets going up and economies going down, and bad news becomes good news, etc. Bonds go up, <laughs> bonds go up, Fuel equities go, go up. up. Yeah. yeah, and at a certain <laughs> point, you know the market impacts become. Um, you know, market enough that they actually start to lift economic activity as well. Wow. So the system you know, works. Well, <laughs> you know, it's just that markets start to drive economies rather than the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay, very good. Um eventually it comes back to the the, the real economy needs to eventually. Yes. Yep. But you can go through short periods where yeah. The markets just, just a quick one, sorry, on the on the shale side. So you mentioned before with the shale having, um, you know, a, a, a high yielding period in the early stages of the, of it, and then it's sort of essentially backing off, and that's the cream, at, you know, for a project. Is it is this, um, and given obviously the huge, you know, increase in shale as we've just been sort of covering off on, um, 
Is, is this sort of something that can continue sort of ad nauseum? Like, is this sort of, is this going to, you know, perhaps one day replace a, a Middle Eastern reliance on oil for the US, given the fact that oil demands may fall with the, you know, introduction of, you know, well, proliferation of electric vehicles? Is this, could it, could it see, uh, you know, almost an independence from Middle Eastern oil um, in, well, you know, in the midterm, perhaps, maybe, or long term? Arguably, US is... I mean, they're, they're a net exporter now, so... Yep. You know, they're, they're already there. You could argue they're, they're already independent. But, yeah. but is it sustainable at this level? Obviously, there's been a bit of a drive now. If it falls to, say, 25 or 30 bucks a barrel and sits there forever, um, is shale yeah. going to still get the job done or is it some, some time the but, scale is going to need to tip back to the Middle East again? Yeah. Uh, if you cut the prices... If, if the oil price fell to 20, 20 bucks, if, and, and let's say demand... So, say say electric cars, there's a bit of a breakthrough and or batteries, there's a bit of a breakthrough and, yep. and all of a sudden, you know, we're sitting around in... 2028 and and everyone's uh, driving an electric car and so the demand for oil is, is sort of more limited to um, you know maybe airline flights and and uh, carnival cruise ships uh, well there <laughs> it is yeah. <laughs> um, and your uh, um, and what you, and all your chemical sort of uses then yeah so the oil price drops dramatically the cheapest producers still tend to be in the u.s sorry in the in this in the middle, middle east, east. Yep. yeah so that they can generally get it out of the ground at maybe ten dollars a barrel and, and still be productive yep, along, yep. but the other the other thing to keep in mind though is that um most of that cost is is a sunk cost on your uh on your original investment mm. so people who have already drilled the wells already put in the pipelines already got all the everything going their, their cost per year to keep the thing yep. know, per barrel is, is, is much lower than what their overall um, per barrel cost is. Yeah, sure. And they're not going to say, well, you know, if you've, if, if my, if somebody's, so, so the shale guys have an issue because they do a lot faster, but if you've got a traditional well, say, owner who has a break even of $40, mm. um, but 90% of that was all upfront costs or maybe. 75 percent that was all upfront costs and so you know they're uh maybe they're producing at ten dollars the actual barrels but yep. they're, they're losing money on what they they originally put in yeah sure. they're not going to stop just because the oil price falls yep, yep they'll either say they'll either hold back and say okay we're going to wait for the oil price to rise again but if they, if they don't think it's going to rise ever again because demand's gone mm. they're just going to keep pumping till yep. the well's dry yeah okay yeah. Right. It's, it's a terrible bind though isn't it because mm. you know they, they could maybe they can produce it profitably at those levels but you know their their budget break evens are, are like eighty bucks. Yeah, and so you know they they're trying to transition away from all, a future oil dependence that they can see is in trouble. Mm. Uh, but they need you know further investment and uh, you know decent return on their oil to fund any kind of economic transition away from it. Mm. And so you know they could they could certainly flood the market or or indeed keep pumping as demand falls away but at the same time it'll make it very difficult for them to actually transition from the oil itself because they'll be running such huge deficits etc mm. um, in their economies and they're not structured for this very well like a, a lot of those middle eastern countries rely very heavily on um, you know decent return from oil for the budgets to more or less bribe the populace yeah sure yeah uh, you know right almost to the extent that it's it's sort of political legitimacy mm. in some of them so so it's, it's a very difficult question that they face mm. on how to handle the transition away mm. yep okay and, and and some sort of pose the argument that that's you know oh the the you know saudi's budget break even is whatever 60 dollars of oil so that's where the oil price will have to go to it's like saying well no that's not <laughs> that's not the market. That's not, that's not the market. We've, yeah. got a, we've got this broad world market. You know, yeah, yep. that might be a short term. You know, maybe that's where they're, they're short term aiming to get it to, and, and they can get it there for a little bit. But the net effect of you know, it's a, we're, we're living in a global world, yep. and if the the price settles at twenty dollars, then uh, they're going to have to stop paying all their citizens such huge amounts, and yep. there probably will be pop- popular uprisings and a whole bunch of fallouts and, and things of things of that nature. But uh, that's not the. You know, I don't think that's going to prevent. The, the oil price from falling just because you've, mm. got, you've got all these other things going on. Okay. And just, just in wrapping up, so uh, in reflection on our portfolios, uh, themes discussed today, have we got any sort of takeouts from there? What have we been looking at? Yeah, so, it's, well, a lot of it's coming, playing around with the, uh, how much, at what stage do you, do you get oil? So I'd, I'd yeah. be saying, you know, at, at $80 or you know, 70 or $80, you, 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 don't want to, you don't want to be anywhere near it. Yep. Um, at the fifty, sixty dollar level, look, we're in, we're sort of at there. We're in, we're in this trend downwards. I sort of feel that below forty, you'd, you'd 
we'd be looking to buy some. Okay. Uh, and then... So when you say that, you're all um, producing all companies? producing companies, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. depending upon the price of the companies at the time and yep. you know, a whole range of other the factors. metrics, yep. But uh, yeah, I guess that, uh, in, in the current sort of 40 to $60 range, we're, we're pretty ambivalent. Yep. Uh, if we see them really cheap, we'll, we'll buy them, but they're not particularly cheap. Okay. Uh, and so... It's and that that range is just trending down over time. Mm, okay. So what's what's forty to sixty dollars today? Um, you know, in five years' time, could easily be thirty to fifty dollars, mm. or, or or twenty to forty dollars, largely depending upon that whole pickup of the um, the uh, electric cars. And yep. uh, and the the main point I want to make again once more about that is, I don't. That's not going to be a, a linear event. That's going to be a non-linear. All of a sudden, you know, it just drops every, off. Every new car pretty much is, is, is electric Yeah, okay. at, at some mm. stage. When that happens, we don't know. Yep. It does seem as if the next five to 10 years is a pretty good pretty good possibility, Yep. but it might be longer, might be shorter. Okay, all right, very good. And the, the number one macro implication is, is just more deflation. You know, in a world without any kind of inflationary pulse, all oil's gonna make it worse. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, on that bombshell, uh, we'll finish up, but... Uh, and we'll, Worth noting as well, just just quick one, a quick plug for where uh, for anyone in Canberra next Monday night or in Sydney on Wednesday night. That's right. Yeah. So um, yeah, for our uh, for our annual seminars. So that's yes. right. That's leading into that. So next week uh, we've got a uh, one in the in the can. Uh, we're going to reheat the Aussie debt crisis playbook. We thought it was quite timely. That was one that was shot uh, late last year and still stands well today. Um, so that'll be up and available uh, through the the webinar and, uh, and YouTube channel for uh, Thursday whilst we are up on our on our road show. Mm-hmm. So on that note. Well, that's it for now, and thanks for watching. If you like what you heard today and you'd like to hear more, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash subscribe, give us your email address, and in return, we'll send you a weekly email with new webinar topics, links for our podcasts, and other news from Nucleus Wealth. I certainly hope you've got something out of today, as I have, and we'll look forward to catching you with the next one. Cheers. Cheers.